It's great to see so many of you this evening and thank you for taking time from your day to spend it with, uh, with Strawberry Bank. <clears throat> Someone in uh, great imagination called this the State of the Museum, which reminded me too much of the State of the Union address. And um, we're not gonna be that formal tonight. This really is more like a fireside chat to make a historical reference here. And uh, so I'm just gonna chat on for a little while, <clears throat> excuse my voice, and, uh, and then we'll ask some questions on the, at the end. Um, so in answer of two questions that I get day and night, <clears throat> it seems, Everyone wants to know what's happening with the skating rink. Well, the skating rink started to be set up yesterday. So the rink is on its way. We've got permission from the city to do what needs to be done. And uh, so the skating will be up and running sometime in November. And the other question is about stroll. What happens with stroll? So we're gonna turn stroll inside out and everything we, uh, we can do with stroll, we're gonna do outside and it should be a beautiful time uh, we figure about an hour or better walk through the, the site. Houses will be decorated, lights will be up, there'll be trees, there'll be entertainment along the way. And our wonderful staff of, uh, of role players and interpreters will be, uh, will be on hand. So I think people will have a great time. So check the calendar for those dates. There's gonna be a, uh, there's, the first evening is just for members. That's a Thursday evening. So uh, get online and check, check that one out if you would. Um, I want to talk a bit about our response to the pandemic. Uh, to say we were surprised uh, would be under uh, understatement. Like most of us, we were not ready in most cases, not prepared. Uh, but in some cases, we were in a better position than some. Uh, one of the important things is uh, for quite some time, and our chairman is our former chairman, Cynthia Harvell's on the, uh, in the audience tonight. And Cynthia was instrumental in setting up our virtual classroom. So that had been running for a number of years before we got to, uh, to this time period of lockdown. And so we were able to offer an extensive program to the schools and not have to scramble to do that. The other thing is that we've been careful to put away money for an emergency fund. It's not gonna go very far. We didn't get a very early start on that, but we did. Uh, did prepare ourselves for that along the way. Um, there was an inclination, I think, a number uh, among a number of organizations that uh, that we'll just simply tread water. We'll we'll just kind of wait till this is all over. And of course, there were constant predictions about when that was over. Much of the museum world decided that it was going to be January, uh, July first. So you saw a lot of openings in July and others thought it would be in the fall and you saw those museums open, um, but it, uh, it really has not uh, eased. We're open, but we're open in very restricted ways. Um, we chose not to really have that tread water uh, as our guiding uh, light. Um, we adapted and kept building for the future. Now adapted what we were doing at first, we experimented with guided tours. So our guides were outside. They were masked, of course. We asked our guests to be masked. They had a microphone and speaker system so they could be heard. Um, but it just was not a good experience. We finally came to the conclusion uh, for our visitors. There's nothing worse than in 90 degree weather to be standing in, in the middle of a lawn having someone chat at you about history and uh, it just didn't work. So we rethought that and developed a program of uh, self-guided tours, which our visitors have, I think, uh, found much more attractive, much more worthwhile. They get an orientation from a live interpreter in the, in the visitor center, then they're off on their own. And uh, as they go across the campus, they run into uh, various and sundry uh, role players. There's someone at uh, the Ryder Woodhouse talking about that period. Uh, there's someone in the Victory Garden and uh, you'll find a craftsperson here and there. So that's been a, a good pilot for us. So as we plan for future, uh, we'll know, uh, we'll have the basis for a plan that does, does uh, work. 
We did eliminate, of course, a lot of special events, and that was particularly difficult, I think, for members and for the staff. Uh, Vintage and Vine is one of our favorites, and it was canceled along with uh, the uh, beer event and uh, 4th of July, just everything was canceled through the year, and that was a tough one. Uh, where we can, we, we have made adaptations, um, but we'll see what this coming year does for us. Um, we have, ver uh, if you, I'm sure noticed that online, we offered a number of things through the weeks, uh, uh, virtual tours such as horticulture gave a tour, really a wonderful tour uh, through the greenhouse one day. Uh, that, that was great. And departments have done a variety of those as well. The Sherburne House Committee, looking ahead uh, to the re-restoration of that wonderful early uh, building, uh, late 17th, early 18th century building. That committee is continuing to work away, uh, looking to the future and look, looking to uh, correct some of the judgments that were uh, not clear last time the house was re restored. So uh, that's a good project. Penn Hollow, you know, at the back of the campus uh, is, uh, is uh, focused on a new program for that. Um, the apart, it will uh, have an exhibition uh, which reflects the lives of the Kenneth Richardson family there. Uh, Kenneth Richards was the first black supervisor in the Navy Yard. Uh, popular guy in town, had a dance band, was active in the civil rights movement. So we're looking forward to uh, pulling that into the broader story of what life was like on Puddle Dock, and that would be focused on the 50s and the 60s, which would be great. Uh, we have some applications out there for grants from LCHIP and from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and we do have a, a, a half a million dollar gift toward that project, so uh, we're well on our way to getting it done, and it'll be great to see that building done. It's also part of our Heritage House program. Uh, we started this a little over 10 years ago. We took underutilized or unused spaces across the campus and rented them out. These days we have about 12 residences and about 32 office spaces. And that generates uh, this year uh, over half a million dollars. Um, and I'll mention that uh, uh, along here somewhere that we're also in the midst of restoring three more buildings. Patch House will be restored and will be a residence uh, property. Um, Webster Law Office will be converted to a, a dwelling house. And there's one more that I've forgotten and it's yet in Walsh, which is being worked on right now. I saw Jane Nylander here. Jane probably is as grateful as I am to see this building that sits in the middle of the campus that's been so dilapidated over the years to see it finally restored. So it's well on its way. It's gonna get buttoned down the next couple of weeks uh, so it's ready to face the winter, but in the spring we'll go full force and that will have an apartment, two room apartment on the second floor uh, there. Uh, if you walk around the campus, you'll see that the front of the campus is looking pretty spiffy these days, I gotta say. 28 uh, apple trees uh, with these wonderful plantings of uh, fall daisies that are around the base and ground cover. And so the front of the campus that looked so desperate for so long has been cleaned away and this beautiful, beautiful planting is done. It is in memory of Vivian Treat and uh, was known as the Vivian Treat Honor Garden. And uh, it, it really has sharpened up the campus and we've built uh, new signs there and also at the entrance. And um, we had some interesting internships, virtual internships, thank God for Zoom and uh, FaceTime, and we had 28 participate in the archeological virtual field school, which I found pretty amazing. Good experience uh, for young people. And uh, in the background, research has been going on in the Sherburn House and in the Richardson family. Um, our properties department has not stopped. In fact, they, uh, I shouldn't use the word enjoyed, but the freedom to move around the campus without a lot of visitors in the way was uh, useful. So they uh, restored, rebuilt thresholds, windows, doors, and uh, again, we're, we're working on the Yedden Walsh House. And our education department, uh, you've met Wendy, 
Uh, there are four people in that department and they do great work. They took the virtual classroom and expanded that and then uh, uh, added a, a number of things that made it easier for teachers and for students to enjoy. This summer, of course, we couldn't run our uh, camps for kids. So we ran, wrote, uh, ran a series called Camps at a Distance and the, the kids uh, uh, had activities on Zoom as we are tonight and they received kits delivered to the house. So they actually had physical stuff to work with. Uh, so it was really hands-on. And there were, it was the kind of thing that was structured so that they went outside and uh, spent time on the, on, online and then worked with this box load of, uh, of a variety of things to do. Um, costumes, uh, you know, uh, the Walsh House, the second floor of Walsh House is completely filled with costumes. So those are being uh, reorganized, or I should say, having looked in there, they're being organized. So looking ahead, we have an exhibition that's just complete and we're just waiting for the go ahead for us to open the site fully. And it's called Water Has a Memory and it addresses the sea level rise question, which is also become, which has become a problem here at Strawberry Bank as our historic buildings basements have begun to fill with water on a regular basis. Um, the education department's working with this wonderful company, the best name I've heard in a long time, they're called Time Loopers and they're doing uh, a, a on-site uh, website. Uh, you'll be able to go there and there'll be a map of Puddle Dock with flags. And if you click on the flag, it may open up a building for virtual tour, or it may involve you in some activities of some kind. It might connect you to a role player, the whole variety of things that will be part of that uh, program. So that's pretty exciting. And then we're getting pretty close to actually launching that. So we'll let you know, be, be the first to know on that. Uh, a big project that has uh, been very, very generously funded by the federal government um, is to reopen the Captain Walsh House. The house will be open on the first floor to the public and it will be completely furnished with reproductions. And that will allow us to interpret the house in a different way than we uh, do the other historic houses. So you'll be able to come in and actually participate with uh, the activities in the house. And you might stumble across the captain himself or his wife or a daughter or a neighbor in the house, but I think it's gonna be a good experience for our visitors. Uh, actually, Bethany, who I just called Wendy a minute ago, Bethany, uh, Bethany runs a program called History at Home, and it's uh, our, our program, an extension of our program for homeschoolers. We've had a large number of homeschoolers who have used uh, Strawberry Bank's historic resources, and this is a structured program for them based on the curriculum for, uh, that's adopted and common for all the schools. It's also used as additional material for regular classroom or if you're at home tutoring your own kids, it's a pretty good program to be involved with. Another thing you're gonna be able to get online is called Puddle Dock Packs. And that again is taken off from the success of our summer program where kids uh, can call up and they will deliver a package of materials connected to uh, an online activities. So there's some real hands-on activities going on. Field trips, of course they don't happen right now. I can remember the days of counting 12, 14 school buses in the parking lot. They're not happening this year. So we've offered the opportunity for virtual tours and that project's been expanded. And now there is a live component. So if your school's coming, you can make an appointment ahead of time and you can meet one of the characters on the campus as well. Ask them questions via Zoom. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty good program. Um, Looking ahead, we've made some practical choices here. Um, we're working on the basis that we're going to be looking at a summer very similar to this summer, and that we'll be doing uh, tours outside the buildings and not in the buildings. Uh, we're working to see if we can get one or two exhibition buildings open. Um, most of our problem is that buildings have dead ends and the requirements for opening buildings really don't support that. Uh, but we think a couple of buildings can be open to the public and for next year. Uh, 
And if by some miracle things improve significantly, then we'll very quickly revert to our program that we've done in the past, which has been so strong and well received by people. Uh, our finances, uh, thank God for the uh, payroll protection program, PPP. Uh, the Strawberry Bank received a very large, I guess it's a, a, officially a loan and it eventually turns into a grant for $330,000. So that kept our staff employed. We, uh, we made a pledge early on that our primary goal, our first goal was keeping this core of staff who work so hard and do such a wonderful job and are so faithful to Strawberry Bank that we would do everything we could to make sure that they were employed during this troubled time. And we've been successful so far doing that. We're gonna run some red ink, which we don't like to do at Strawberry Bank. Uh, we're gonna run some red ink this year. Um, and so we're gonna be looking to our friends and our members. Uh, this is the only time I'm gonna to try to pick your pocket tonight. Uh, we look forward to you maintaining your membership and uh, supporting the Strawberry Bank Fund. Uh, and you'll hear about that endlessly between now and the end of the year. So those are the few comments that I wanted to make. I think I caught most everything on my notes here. Can I answer some questions now? So I have received a few very thoughtful questions. Thank you. Um, during this question and answer session, please feel free um, to type any questions into that chat um, and I will get to them and present them uh, to Larry. Thank you. Um, so you've discussed a little bit how uh, SBM has responded, that Strawberry Bank Museum has responded to uh, COVID-19. Can you discuss a little bit about how that affected dynamics um, at work in terms of um, staff um, and, you know, collaborations and shared visions among the staff? Sure. One problem with is our office space. Uh, we all, the majority of the staff work in Studley's Tavern. Um, and as we looked, uh, by the way, to make the visitor center safe for staff, we, uh, we expanded the, uh, the filtering system, the air conditioning system, so that it actually would filter out virus. And that runs continually in that building and protects the people who are in that building, uh, in addition to wearing their masks. Um, but as we looked at Studley's, uh, as this all began, we found out that basically the system there uh, uh, recycles the air that's in the building. So if you've got someone in some corner that's sick, the, it's very likely that that uh, virus is going to get filtered through the, not filtered, but uh, blown through the whole system. So everybody's been working at home. Occasionally people will go into the office. Finance has to work on their software in their office. Um, but we're very careful about that. Uh, going on. So uh, people have communicated across uh, uh, with their computers and uh, we get together once a week as a staff, every single person on the staff, so everybody's up to date. Uh, it's a level of cooperation I didn't seen before, to be perfectly honest. Everybody's been very helpful to each other. Uh, it is really difficult uh, to uh, keep the communications going. When we're used to seeing each other in the hallway, um, that's where a lot of business and a lot of creativity happens. Somebody gets up from their chair and runs across the hallway to talk to somebody. And that's a little more difficult now than it has been in the past. Um, but this crew has worked well together and we've made, uh, made decisions together about the directions we've been taking. So it was good. And could you give us a, an update on the capital campaign? Sure. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, we're running a capital campaign and that campaign is focused on expanding the endowment and addressing finishing up the Heritage House program, which is restoration of the remaining buildings and then money to support the education uh, programs of Strawberry Bank. Our goal is $15 million. Everybody take a gulp there. That's a lot of money but we're at over $10 million in pledges and cash so far. So we, uh, we halted uh, a little bit during this pandemic to kind of catch our breath and see where we were headed. 
So uh, that campaign is continuing. And uh, I do think we've got a good possibility of, of making the goal. That will enlarge the endowment significantly by, so well, we figure between six and $7 million, which will be great uh, for the institution uh, in terms of keeping it stable in the future. And it will allow us to pay our staff uh, decent salaries and pay for the things, the bills that we're gonna have. And uh, we've been very, this is an institution that's been very conservative in managing its money. And up to this point, we've been taking 4% draw each year, which is pretty, uh, pretty conservative, but one that will ensure that that money is there for future generations. So we're really focused on sustainability. And if I don't answer your question fully, <laughs> come back around in the chat and, when, and Bethany will, uh, will remind me of what I've forgotten. Um, sticking with uh, financials here, could we talk a little bit about uh, Mambo's bankruptcy and how that might affect any um, future plans we have? Sure. Um, I don't know what to tell you at this point. It's uh, uh, the company Mambo exists and it owns the lease to the restaurant building, which is the Dunaway store. And uh, so the the courts will decide whether what kind of bankruptcy they declare and the type of bankruptcy they declare will determine how the, the lease relates back to Strawberry Bank. And uh, so uh, you should feel comforted as I do that we, uh, if the lease is sold, we have, uh, we have the opportunity to uh, agree or not agree with that purchase. So that pretty much ensures that we won't have a problem tenant in there, hopefully. Um, so that's where we are right at this point. And uh, it changes by the day. So that's, that's actually yesterday's news. I don't know what happened today. And could you uh, tell us a little bit about plans for the skating rink, um, how they're going to operate this year? Are there going to be reservations, food service? Yeah. Uh, food service, no. Uh, that is one of the most difficult things to work with on the city, um, and rightfully so. So we eliminated the food, uh, I think is completely uh, gone. Uh, the, the visitor center will be given over 100% to the skating rink. So both the dining room and the lecture hall will be uh, available to skaters and we'll do all the things that are required in terms of distancing and wearing a mask. You have to wear a mask when you're on the skating rink. You have to maintain some distances when you're on the skating rink. The city I currently gave us, I think, occupancy, excuse me, of 90. We never have 90 skaters on the rink. So uh, that's a good number for us. And um, so skate, uh, we're going to encourage people to make reservations ahead of time online, pay for everything online, so we don't have to deal with that here. Skate rentals will still go on, skate sharpening, um, those things, but the visitor center will be 100% skating rink. When we do stroll, we'll probably sell tickets to stroll from the front of Goodwin Mansion, which is a good, got a good spot on the front of the campus there. And, and it's really the beginning of the uh, stroll trail through Strawberry Bank. So um, I think that will work out. Um, and do you have any suggestions, ideas about how to encourage other people to become members um, as this is such a challenging time for the museum when we can't <laughs> operate as usual? Uh, yeah, uh, let me go back. I wanted to mention one more thing about the skating rink and it, it's escaped me at this. Oh. The public shows that we've done in the past are also a victim of the, of the uh, virus here. So we won't be doing the ice shows that we've done in the past. In terms of membership, um, I think just members encouraging members, others to support Strawberry Bank. Uh, right now, there are a number of services. I think we do a lot for, uh, we, we enjoy these programs that we're doing and I hope you enjoy them as well. Um, so it would be encouraging your friends to join as well along the way. 
And uh, let's talk a little bit about Vintage and Vine. Uh, it's historically been one of our bigger fundraisers. Right. Um, given that it was canceled this year, can you talk a little bit about that event's future? Sure. Uh, I think there's a committee that's working on something, uh, 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 going at it from a number of different directions uh, and uh, looking at other organizations, what they've done to replace their galas. All of them have been canceled that I've seen and then have been resurrected at different time periods. Um, so we're looking at a variety of things. Uh, some, present, some, some will involve some uh, online activity, probably a silent auction, which seems to have gone well for a number of organizations. We're also looking at one, my, my former uh, employer, Hancock Shaker Village, did something we thought was kind of interesting. They, uh, their gala was actually, uh, you could order a meal from one of the great chefs in the Berkshires and pick it up at the village and uh, it had flowers and a bottle of wine and, and candles and whatever, and you could actually spread your blanket out on the lawn at, at Hancock Shaker Village or take it home with you. And that was their gala. I think that was a pretty good solution to the similar kinds of programs they've been running. So we're taking a lot of, uh, a lot of ideas and looking at them. And if, you're, if you have an idea, please give me a call. We'd, uh, we'd like to uh, get as many uh, 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 ideas out there to discuss. It's, it's really sad. It's a difficult thing because I always think of vintage and vine as a time that I get to see you and you get to see me and we get to see each other. And uh, it's been blessed uh, over the years uh, with no rain. I think we had one year of rain. So it's been a great event. And when we get the opportunity, we'll come back to that as well. Bethany. Uh, Fig Tree has been a great addition to campus, that cafe that operates out of the visitor center. Can you talk a little bit about their future with us since we did not have them on site this year? Sure. I think uh, hopefully when we get back to whatever normal is, when we're not so many restrictions on food, uh, that Fig Tree will come back and, and uh, work with us again. They were really part of the family and we enjoyed working with them and the food was good. So uh, that's the requirement. So in our conversations with them, the, uh, our expectation is that when things change back to normal, they will come back to Strawberry Bank. And are there any plans for uh, New Hampshire pop-up or Portsmouth pop-up to come to the Strawberry Bank campus? Uh, we were asked about that and our response was, we'd love to talk with you about it um, and we never had an official contact after that. Um, there was an informal discussion with a staff member here and their needs were more than we could actually supply. They needed electric and they needed wastewater disposal and they needed water and it, we just couldn't get those services to them. And so we haven't heard, we've have not heard from them again. I suspect that that won't happen. I can pretty firmly say it won't happen now. We're too far down the road. And can you tell us a little bit about plans for Candlelight Stroll this year? A little bit more in depth about what the event will entail. Yes. Uh, uh, we, of course, are, are some of, we're restricted by what uh, the state will let us do. So one is limiting the number of people at an exhibition so uh, we'll sell time tickets. Hopefully people will buy those online, buy a time ticket, and that will let us spread the crowd out. Um, we have to, people will have to wear masks, but there'll be a prescribed pathway through, through the site, through the neighborhood that will wander through the neighborhood and there'll be lights and the horticultural department that has been so wonderful over the years, decorating the interiors, will decorate the outsides of the buildings um, and there'll be our, uh, there'll be uh, our uh, uh, costume staff and regular staff there as well to talk to people. Uh, one of the issues has been music, which is a problem. You can't take a grand piano or a harpsichord out in the snow. Uh, it doesn't really work very well that way. So uh, we've been looking to see about the music. And of course, music, uh, musicians, 
have been hard hit, particularly people who sing uh, with the virus. So that's another issue we're concerned about. So um, there'll be a variety of, of activities that you'll recognize, but they'll be outside this time. And we received the comment that you've developed a winning team. Um, how do you plan to keep it all together in light of the pandemic? <laughs> uh, it is a great team. It really is. Um, I'm hoping they'll all stay. I think they're going to stay. Um, I think this level of, uh, of emergency has, has really drawn this group of people together. And uh, I see uh, I see a harder push on being creative and organized. And when I see budgets these days, people are thinking about uh, how can we get things done uh, efficiently and in a way that uh, is supportive to this to the museum's finances. I see conversations that are among staff that are far looking. They're, they're looking uh, down to the, they're looking to the future as well as the present, getting through the present time. So I can't praise them enough for all the good work they do. And it's not been easy and for anybody anywhere, um, but, and it takes forever to get all the uh, electronics to work and everybody a computer that has a camera and a speaker and is tied together. Bethany's smiling because she knows. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I, I, I don't know that we've ever had a staff meeting where we've actually seen everybody because everybody's struggling with their computers, but at least they hear each other along the way. Bethany. You mentioned our new exhibit um, on sea level rise and yes. Welsh House. Is there anything else you can share with us about plans for uh, next season? Those are, for Strawberry Bank, those are two big very big projects uh, and um, what we hope with uh, the Captain Walsh House is that we'll be able to inspire visitors to actually sit down and have conversations with each other and with, with whoever's interpreting in the house that day and then we work that into as we get more comfortable doing that kind of interpretive work uh, we'll spread that and hopefully We'll be looking at the restoration of Penn Hollow in another year. I'm gonna knock on wood because we have a very strong application to the National Endowment for the Humanities. So if we get that grant, then that will move the restoration of that building forward. And I think the opportunity to interpret the history of a black family in mid 20th century in Puddle Dock, is gonna be very, very strong, particularly since we have uh, Kenneth Richardson working in the Navy Yard and on the other end of the campus, we have a house that housed a family where the father worked in the, sh in, in the uh, shipyard as well. So it'll be a nice, uh, nice platform to have discussions. Um, we're working on Sherburn. Sherburn is a project that is going to take significant funding. Uh, if you were around the campus, you saw the chimney come down out of the center of the building. I, I see one head nodding in this group. Uh, it should have come down a long time ago. Um, but because of the, and here's a tie together, because of the water in the basements, the chimney in that building began to shift because of inadequate foundation under it. And it was leaning on the frame. And so uh, a, a frame that portion of that's from uh, the late 17th century, uh, it's not a good thing to be causing that, to, allowing that to happen. So the chimney was taken down and will be rebuilt in a style that we now know we have more information and more understanding of that period of architecture. So that will be restored at some point. Um, according to our uh, restoration carpenter, John Schnitzler, the frame after they took the, the chimney down actually shifted slightly. So uh, we were, he was correct in, in thinking that the chimney was putting the building at risk. So that's taken care of. And uh, the Sherburn uh, will be out looking for some money. A uh, portion of that house will be, um, if you remember the house, I'm sure you do when you walk in, uh, the room on the right, on your right hand, the East Room, has that wonderful painted ceiling. Um, we're actually brought in a conservator to look at that. 
make sure that it, it's preserved for the future and we protect it. That room will be used as an exhibition space and uh, that exhibit's being designed right now. And then the, uh, the hall uh, room on the left side as you walked in, uh, will, west side of the building, will be done with re again with reproduction so that people can experience uh, the room of that period with the artifacts. And we're fortunate we have some inventories, uh, they don't hit spot on to this time period, but they do give us a hint of what, what might have been in the house. So it's gonna be, I think, a really wonderful exhibition for people. And it, again, it fits into this uh, program where, where you're walking around Strawberry Bank and you're experiencing households and family life, community life in a, a fairly broad um, period of history on that. Bethany. Uh, what lessons do you think have been learned through this pandemic that are going to be beneficial to the long-term financial health and the security of the museum? It's hmm. a good question. Um, it, uh, all, I, I can't, can't think of very few mu museums that are not heavily dependent on the gate. So, uh, all, and all those related things like the museum store and, uh, and a cafe or a restaurant. So I think the lesson learned here is figuring out how to add enough variety, uh, enough different activities to your income sources so that they're, you're not overly dependent on one so that if one disappears, then you're, then you're in trouble. Uh, generally, we budget about $320,000 for visitation. Uh, this year, we budgeted 50. So you can see the, the issue there is a quarter of a million dollars uh, gone out of that budget. So uh, as you would diver diversify your portfolio, museums need to diversify their sources of income. And increasingly important is our endowments. Uh, Strawberry Bank struggled for years without much of an endowment, and now that's uh, begun to build. And I suspect uh, by the time we get done with this campaign and people have paid their pledges, and by the way, they've been very good at paying their pledges during this time period, I think we'll have an endowment of about $15 million, which, uh, which is pretty, uh, pretty solid uh, uh, backing and will help with the stability of the institution over time. And we have somebody interested in the greenhouse restoration. Um, is that part of the capital uh, campaign or are there other plans in place uh, to restore that spot? I, I will actually be honest and say, I can't remember. <laughs> we're, ded we're dedicated to actually, actually uh, restoring this building um, and it needs to be restored. Uh, it, but it's a little bit, you have to be, it came from a Wentworth uh, at a time period uh, quite a long time ago and really is uh, not really a greenhouse. It's really was meant to, to be not used during the winter times, but during the spring. Um, so it, it's kind of like Abraham Lincoln's uh, ax, you know, the head's been replaced twice and the handle's been replaced three times. So there's not a lot of original material in that building. So that's raised some questions for us about how we're gonna deal with that because it, it uh, is an important building to the horticultural program. And the horticulture program is uh, important to what we do and to our visitors. So all that to say, we're dedicated to, to doing something. We just haven't figured out where it was and we'll find the money for that. We do have, as I've talked about this, I'm remembering this now. We do have one donor who stepped forward with a fairly large gift to get that started. Uh, one of one of it's actually uh, from a plan to gift one of our our founders uh, uh, established for Strawberry Bank, and so uh, they had some extra money, so they said we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll make a pledge towards that particular building. But what it's going to be and how we're going to deal with it, we don't we don't know yet on that. Thank you. Um, and you talked a little bit about virtual programming. Um, 
We mentioned Time Looper, for example. Um, can you go into a little more details about what virtual programs we will be offering? Um, and the second part of this question is, what long-term effects do you see uh, all this virtual programming having on how museums do business? Yeah, I was just reading an article in the American Association for State and Local Histories, uh, History News, which is their periodical, quarterly periodical. And that question came up, is, is this change drastically the way museums are going to operate in the future? And people are going to be uh, doing all the things they did in the past with museums, are they going to be doing them online? I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm a conservative or whether I'm a liberal on this issue. I'm not sure where the positions are, but I think people love what we do and they want to do it and they want to be there and they don't want to do it virtually. They want to come to Strawberry Bank and they want to walk around and they want to see craftspeople doing things and they want to be able to talk to the craftspeople and enjoy the environment. That I live on the campus, as many of you know, and it's one of the privileges of living here is being on this incredibly beautiful property and interacting with uh, craftspeople working on the property, our staff working on the property, and lots of people who just walk through. And I don't think that that's ever going to go away. I think people are going to want the real experience versus the virtual experience. But I do think that we will do more and more school programming and more specialized programming uh, virtually than we've done in the past. The time loopers is just a, a perfect example of that. Um, we ran into them, I ran into them for the first time at a conference and, uh, uh, and they're doing a, a sales job, of course. And they, uh, if you're on the, uh, on the, the green uh, near uh, the Washington Monument in Washington, DC, there's a little building that actually you don't really notice. And uh, one story classically built uh, white stone building. And it was one of the canal buildings. The canal ran uh, through Washington at that point. And the time loopers have taken uh, so that you can actually take a pair of binoculars and look out the window of that building and see what it looked like in 1820. And the activity, you can see the canal boat go by and you can see, uh, people working and walking around. It's just an incredible technology. And I think we'll see more and more of that kind of thing. Actually, I was in the, in, in the conference hall with this guy and he handed me these, the binoculars and I looked and there was a young woman ba uh, uh, ballet dancing in the middle of the floor. I looked, she wasn't there. I looked and she was there. It's just incredible. And I, I think those kinds of things we'll, we'll see more of as we go along. And that the incredible thing is that the cost of those things is dropping drastically. Now, what we don't want to do, what I don't want to do, uh, as long as I'm here, is to become overly de dependent on those, those flashy, virtual kinds of activities. It would be easy to be sucked into that, uh, that way of doing things and not the emphasis, uh, as long as I'm here and as long as the board agrees, well, the emphasis is gonna be on the real thing and the authentic. That's what I wanna see. I wanna see, uh, I wanna see Mount Vernon in person. I don't wanna see it uh, through a camera. Uh, so I don't know if that, there were two parts to that question. I think they just wanted a little more detail about what virtual programming will be offering. Yeah. So I think, I mean, Bethany is a perfect example of doing the homeschool program online that a brand new curriculum. And um, I think we'll, we'll see more of that. It actually probably worked better, uh, work in many ways to have that group of kids uh, being educated online. And then they come in into the site when it's possible to do that which we will hope will be soon. Yes, Bethany. And uh, you mentioned again, we talked about sea level rise a bit. Can right. you talk a little bit more about the long-term effects of basement flooding and any long-term expenses associated with that? Uh, we don't know the answer to that. Well, let's go back. The basements of the buildings flood uh, at high tides. 
Some of the buildings actually, you can see the tide go in and out by looking at the basement floor. Um, but we don't know what the solutions are. That's what we're working with uh, the university and we're working with the city and we're working with scientists um, because there are a lot of problems with that, uh, you can imagine. One is it introduces an incredible le level of humidity into a historic building. So you've got a building in some cases that's wet on the inside and it's dry outside and it just plays havoc with, with uh, both the building and then its contents as well. So, but then again, if you start sealing up the basements, then we run into other problems. So it's a complex issue of which I really can't, I can speak to the fact that it's complex. I don't know what the solutions are. We don't know what the solutions are yet, but we're working on them. Um, and uh, we've had some pretty high water here. So it's fairly recent. And I've been here for 15 years and I have never seen Marcy Street flood until last, last year. And then Marcy Street was pretty, uh, the low parts on Marcy Street were pretty much flooded. Uh, and what we forget is the really uh, surface water is one thing, but uh, uh, underground pressure is uh, water pressure is another issue uh, that we're dealing with. And that's all I can tell you, sorry. But when you come, <laughs> when you come to see this exhibition, you'll have a, a number of, uh, of, of your questions answered. I'm not sure even at that point when the exhibit opens and I'm not sure when that will be. Uh, and the exhibit is, it's, it's very strange, but the exhibit is pretty much done and it's sitting there, uh, not open to the public quite yet. Um, but I'm not sure how long, it's gonna take a while to come up with the solutions for historic buildings. There is a national group um, and it's called History Above Water um, that is addressing those. So it's not just Strawberry Bank, but it's other institutions. And you can imagine historically, where did people settle? next to the river or next to the shore. And uh, so uh, there's an extraordinary amount of uh, historic property that's at risk. Some of it very soon. Bethany. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, could you talk a little bit about the boat shop um, and any future role it might play at the museum? The boat shop, uh, yeah. Uh, we, we've been working uh, with Nat um, on the boat shop here, um, but we haven't been able to commit any funds to that. So it makes the program difficult to, to have with any consistency. Um, and I'm not sure with the boat shop, whether you mean what we call the carpentry shop now, which used to be the boat shop for many, many years. Um, if we had a more robust program, we probably would think about moving that into the carpenter shop. The long-term plan for the campus is to have a building in uh, what is commonly known as the dumpster lot. I like to call it the uh, Washington Street lot, but it's called the dumpster lot. And uh, there is a plan to, to build a building there that would combine a number of things together, but would be basically have a carpentry shop that would support the uh, constant and continual uh, uh, care of uh, 39 historic buildings. Uh, the facility we have now in what was the boat shops really pretty inadequate to do the kinds of things that need to be done on a regular basis. Um, the boat shop, again, uh, the, in long term, there's a commitment to doing more with boat building, but it's, uh, it's a financial issue rate right at this point. Another question? I think that just about wraps us up. Um, okay. I think all that's left for us to say is thank you so much for joining us this evening. Yes. And again, thank you for being members, uh, for supporting the museum.